We're going to call the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority meeting to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call roll. I'll call roll for you today. So we will start with Chairperson Olivia Diaz, Vice Chair William McCurdy. Present. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Present. Commissioner Sharon Davis. Here. Commissioner Michael Disman. Here. Commissioner Sharon Davis is twice. I'm sorry. It's a mistake. No, it says Sharon, but that's a mistake. Commissioner Tick Sigerbloom. Here. Commissioner Dan Shaw. Commissioner Luciana Turner. Present. A quorum is present, and we are in compliance with Nevada Open Meeting Law. Uh, thank you so much. I'll ask members of the board to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank And as a my reminder, these are uh, public comment for items that are listed on the agenda. John Johnson for the record. Um, I think it was probably about six months ago when the committees first came and you guys appointed the committee members to these various committees. And at that time, I asked a question about were these committees supposed to follow the open meeting law? And I was told, I believe it was the chairwoman that told me that they don't have to follow open meeting law, but actually they do. I actually did some research. I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is, uh, this time is reserved for items that are on the yeah, agenda. You guys are giving, getting reports on seven, which is the executive committee, the operations committee, the administrative and finance committee, the Supportive Services Residents Affairs Committee and the Bylaws Committee. Okay. So this is the committees that I'm talking about that are supposed to follow open meeting law policy. So when they meet, just like you guys had the bylaws meeting where they made a recommendation for you guys to change the bylaws, which was brought to this body, and you guys made a decision on that. So per the uh, NRSs, it specifically says that Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask for our legal counsel to weigh in and um, we'll go from so, there. So, well, how can I finish telling Just you? one second. Uh, so, that's, it's not an agenda item that's being decided on. It's just a report. So, you can save your uh, comments for the open public comment at the end of the meeting. Now, you do you guys are talking about these committee reports. So, when they report, they can't talk about you know, how, are they going to be open meeting? I mean, I don't understand. It's on the agenda. It's not an item for action. It's a report from the committees. And so your correct. So, I, so your uh, public comment can be I, saved I, to the I'll end of the meeting. I'll wait for the end. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else here looking to comment on items that are posted on the agenda? Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine, number five. Um, you guys, I was reading the agenda online, and last month, you guys put in there, Phyllis Carpenter keeps complaining of mold, or it says her apartment's infested. Every time that my comments are twisted, it isn't what I say, it's what they, what they perceive it as, but the mold count has always gone up. I don't know what else to say other than they twist my words, and it ain't right. Well, um... Thank you. If you will wait for the conclusion of the agenda, uh, we will have uh, your corrections uh, reflected and read into the record. All right. Is there anyone here uh, wishing to testify for public comment this time? All right. Um, we'll move on to agenda item uh, number three. Uh, approval of the minutes, I'll entertain a motion and we'll have it reflected that the corrections will be made uh, once we uh, have an update from Ms. Carpenter. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor? All opposed? 
We have two abstentions uh, with Councilwoman, or excuse me, our chair uh, not being present but absent excused, and also Councilman Black who just stepped out. Eight. Votes do we have? So three, six. Six. Six in favor, um, two abstain, one abstain and one excuse. Six in favor, yep. Okay, thank you. I will now move uh, to uh, item number four, uh, approval of the agenda uh, with the inclusion of any emergency items and deletion of any items. Uh, is there a motion for approval of the agenda? All right, we have a, a first by Commissioner Segerbloom, a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? All abstain. Agenda is approved. Six in favor, one abstention, one absent excuse. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, our consent agenda. Um, item number five. Is there a motion for approval? Move to approve the consent All right, we have a first from Commissioner Sagerbloom. Second. And we have a second uh, from Commissioner Turner. All in favor? Aye. All abstain? All opposed? All right, we have six in favor, one abstain, uh, one absent excuse. Moving to section number three, commissioners and executive directors uh, recognitions. Good afternoon, commissioners. I have, uh... Thank you. I have uh, a few names to uh, announce that uh, have passed since the last time we got together. Um, we have Gary Mims, Jr., Saul Jen, Ling Tong, Alfredo Calderon, Marilyn Misak, Ada Eichel, Doris Milner, Nina Phillips, Gideon Allen, Tawana Crawford, Orange Thomas, Joan Drew, Carol Jackson, Lee McCarthy, and Denise Hollinser. These are um, members of our family that have passed on since the last time we met. I ask that everyone join us in a moment of silence to acknowledge our departed. Thank you so much. We're now moving to section number four. Uh, we don't have anything under the section, so we'll go to item number five, and we'll receive a report from our committee chairs. Uh, is there uh, uh, any member from the executive committee that would like to report back, being that our chair is not present at this time? I'm sorry, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may interrupt. Commissioner Olivia Diaz is actually present. She is dialed in remotely. Okay. Chairperson Diaz, can you hear me? Can you acknowledge your presence? She's still muted. Commissioner Diaz, can you unmute and acknowledge your presence for us, for the record? You turn it up. You turn it up. Commissioner Diaz. So we'll just note for the record, Vice Chair McCurdy, that actually Chairperson Diaz is actually present for this meeting. All right, let the uh, record reflect the corrections. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, the Operations Committee. Commissioner Segerbloom, do you have an update for the committee at this time? Yes, the committee did not meet this, this today, yesterday or today, so I don't have a report today. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to the Administration and Finance Committee. Uh, Commissioner Shaw is not present with us today, so we'll move forward with the Supportive Service and Resident Affairs Committee. Uh, Commissioner Davis? Oh, excuse me. She's not present with us as, as well. Uh, and there was not a, a bylaws committee meeting to report back on. Uh, we'll now receive a report from our executive director. Thank you. Um, I wanted to first of all introduce my, my new um, executive assistant, Cynthia Reese, who's um, working with Dina today. Cynthia will be, Cynthia, wave your hand there. Cynthia is our new executive assistant. And uh, I want to thank Dina for shepherding, shepherding her through this first board meeting. Um, also wanted to thank the residents at Jamestown Towers for their flexibility and patience 
that's been shown through the, uh, we've had some issues with the boiler. I want to acknowledge my, uh, our public housing staff for their hard work in, in making sure that boiler was up and running again. Unfortunately, I learned this morning that we're having some additional difficulties. Staff is on site right now to address the uh, issues and we're hoping that by tomorrow it will all be corrected. But a couple weeks ago, we, uh, particularly during the cold, uh, during a cold period, we had some significant issues with the boiler. We were able to take people and put them in hotels, um, get space heaters. I'm, I'm ex while we know things are going to happen, I'm very proud of the responsiveness of the team and equally as proud of the, the collaboration between us and the tenants there to make sure that everybody was safe. So I wanted to acknowledge that. I also want to thank the, uh, the board, City of Las Vegas, and, um, and Nevada Hand for hosting a wonderful reception for my wife and I um, last Thursday. The spirit of collaboration and partnership was clearly in the air, and we're excited to be a part of this great community. Um, during the reception, I spoke of priorities that uh, I've identified so far, and knowing that these priorities will build but I, I thought I'd take a moment and share those priorities with those of you who were not present at the reception. Um, we talked about maximizing our resources to use tools like project-based vouchers that can assist us in providing housing for special populations like veterans, homeless, um, the 100 plan with the goal of expanding affordable housing throughout the, um, throughout, throughout the region. I um, also talked about efforts that we're gonna put forward to really see if we can get HUD to reassess our distribution of vouchers here in the region. And the example I give is that when you look at the, um, the growth that we've seen over the last 20 years, I like to say we've gone somewhere from 400,000, close to 2.6 million people in our region. And yet we, um, we've only been allotted 12,000 Section 8 vouchers from the federal government. When we compare that to a city like Chicago, who has 2.7 million people in Chicago proper, they've been allowed it, allotted, excuse me, close to 50,000 Section 8 vouchers. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a task that we're willing to take on. I'm in communication currently with um, the Rural Housing Authority of Nevada, as well as Reno, and we're putting together a strategy that no doubt I'll come back to you as a commission to support us moving forward with an official request of our government, our federal government, to provide a greater allocation so that we can serve the people in our communities. Um, the um, other item that I talked about in the way of priority was a, um, a, a strong recommitment to customer service and service delivery, both internally and externally. And that's especially as it relates to our landlord partnership. We're doing some amazing things um, with the additional resources that we've been given. Uh, for example, um, vouchers to address homelessness. And as we are receiving these vouchers, working with the county to make sure services are available, we also need to make sure that we have places for folk to live. And so staff is, uh, we're, we're undertaking a big reintroduction, recommitment, to um, partnering with landlords. And as we get closer to an event, i like to let make you all aware of and have, actually have you come out if time permits to say a few words. The, um, the other thing, and last but certainly not least, is that continue to build on opportunities to support our families to help them get towards self-sufficiency and personal growth, um, further identifying resources and collaborations in the community allowing, additionally making all of our affordable housing communities sustainable for those who live with us and desirable for those who would like to come and live with us. Again, these are just a few of the priorities that I mentioned that, um, just a few of the items that, that I mentioned as a way of priorities. Um, while we're ever, you know, getting, getting ourselves acclimated into the community. I wanted to remind the uh, commission that next Thursday, we have our kickoff for the CNI, um, CNI grant. And this, this is the, um, the grant, the planning grant grant we received in conjunction with the city, 
which will allow us two years to do planning around Marble Manor, which is a part of the 100 plan on the historic west side. Uh, I, I can't tell you how important this is. First of all, um, the um, Choice Neighborhood Initiative is what CNI stands for. There were 32 housing authorities around the country that applied for the CNI grant, the uh, implementation grant. Of the 32 housing authorities, we were one of eight to receive. So that's, that's monumentous alone. We, we were one of the eight to receive a grant. The grant will be in somewhere in the neighborhood of $700,000 over the next two years. Um, during that time, I, I think it's, it'll just be very critical that we can show as a, as a community how well we can work together and planning, you know, the revitalization of, you know, of, of the community, Marble Manor, the, the support of the 100 plan. And, and what's, what's interesting here, I would assume some of the other grantees, at least from what I understand, are starting to put a plan together. We have a plan. We've been working with the 100 plan. We've been working, you know, on, on ways in which we can restore the historic West Side. So I, I would hope that that would give us some advantage. But if we do this right, two years, two and a half years from now, we could potentially get a uh, implementation grant that's uh, in the size of somewhere um, $30 million or more, and that'll support overall efforts. So I, I just thought it was important that we, um, that I mentioned that and that we're on the 24th, there'll be a, uh, a number of us who the, the HUD visit will be virtual. So there'll be a number of us who will be on a, on a call with HUD to talk about the work. And I just want to thank everyone who's been involved so far in pulling, um, pulling this, this effort together. See, I'm continuing to get into the community and meet with our partners while finding ways to, um, to just build stronger collaborations. Uh, I'm excited about the recommitment we're, we're making in the county to address homelessness. Um, we're looking at having some sort of bidders uh, information, uh, educational form, just again, to, to let folk know how excited we are to be a part of community and support, um, support the, the overall efforts to provide, a, to provide better affordable housing. And let's see, I think that said the more. Um, I've had a chance to visit a number of the jurisdictions. So if I, if I haven't gotten to yours, I'm on the way. Had a really good meeting up in Henderson the other day. Um, you know, we've met with the county to just, again, talk about synergy and alignment so that we can uh, make sure that at some times in the near future, I'm really, really hoping that whenever there's a conversation about affordable housing in this region, that the housing authorities always has a prominent seat at the table. I think that we're the, we should be considered the, a, a premier resource as it relates to affordable housing. And we have the tools and we're looking to partner to make sure that not only we can preserve affordable housing, but also that we can expand affordable housing. So Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions from the board? Mr. Chair, Mr. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, you are at the table because we, thanks to Commissioner, uh, Ch Vice Chair McCurdy, on last Tuesday's uh, County Commission agenda, we talked about this issue and everybody kept saying, where's the housing authority? Where's the housing authority? So they think you're going to build us 70,000 units. So get ready. All righty. <laughs> uh, I'll put my tool belt on. Yes. <laughs> Chairwoman Diaz. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Lewis, what is your level of experience with the CNI process? Um, in your previous positions, have you been able to be participating or carrying out this kind of a grant? And um, wanted to know if you were successful in the past in obtaining the additional monies for the build out. Well, I, I have not worked at an agency that's received a uh, implementation grant. Um, predecessors to CNI were Hope Six and grants like that that I have worked at agencies that have received. And, and as I, I mentioned in my earlier comments, from what I understand about the implementation or the uh, planning grant, you know, HUD is looking, 
you know, to see if a community collectively is able to come together and express not only its interest in rebuilding housing or, or um, expanding affordable housing, but rebuilding communities, changing lives and people. And one of the things that, things that makes me excited about our opportunity here are the number of people who are at the table, you know, making sure that the resident voice is heard, making sure that, you know, as with, with, with anywhere, if you, you focus on only one component of a community, that community really doesn't, doesn't rise the way it should. But if there's a concerted effort to look at economics, look at jobs, look at housing, look at health care, look at the arts. Those are the types of things that my understanding HUD wants to see revitalization of community. And I think that again, over the next couple of years, we're primed to position ourselves to, uh, to convince them that we're a um, ideal um, community for those funds. Follow up, Madam Chair. Uh, no, thank you. I just wanted to see, since uh, obviously that wasn't part of uh, the scope of information that we, um, you know, as we vetted candidates, just wanted to know for myself if Mr. Jordan had gone through the process. Um, but I'm excited that the city of Las Vegas is embarking on this joint uh, venture with the Housing Authority and many other community members. And I just wanted to ensure everyone that we haven't left the community behind in these conversations that it's something that uh, we will make sure that the community is made part of every step of the way and i know that councilman creer uh, i know commissioner mccurdy and um, everyone who's really invested in seeing marble manor um, be the best and the brightest uh, and newest hopefully addition in, in the future of the historic west side we know that it's been a, a long, uh, it'll be a long time uh, in the works, but well, we, I think we will, we look forward to seeing an amazing outcome for our community who has been longing this kind of investment forever. If I can just add to the, your, your comments, um, in this planning process, there will be plenty of opportunity, and I'm sure we'll take advantage of, of having um, situations where either we can go or I can have peers around the country that can consult with us. Uh, as we're in this process, we have one of the most recognized um, developer consultants in EJP helping to shepherd us through this. But what I've come to learn um, in, in processes like this instead of trying to reinvent the wheel you know reach out to my peers who've done it you know i i can give a number of names that um you know, of of other communities who've received the implementation grant and so we'll heavily you know rely on those relationships and those lessons learned to see if we can position ourselves to be the one of the ideal candidates Thank you. Is there anyone else on the board who wishes to uh, ask questions of our executive director? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to item nine. Are there any emerging issues? I Come have in. one, Mr. Vice Chair. Chairman Diaz. Thank you. Um, I just caught wind of this announcement that the governor made yesterday. Um, he was saying that uh, the state, uh, the Nevada Housing Division announced 300.7 million or 87% of Nevada's 2021 tax exempt bonding authority has been earmarked for affordable housing. And so I just wanted to um, put that on our radar and see how we can, um, I don't know, leverage these resources or be helpful to other nonprofits um, that are in the affordable housing space um it says that it's a historic investment being made in uh affordable housing uh given that nevadans are facing um, an acute housing crisis where the average cost of um a home or an apartment right now is about fifteen hundred dollars a month 
and that's obviously way over what a lot of our folks can afford. And so uh, I just wanted to see how the, what the Nevada is doing and follow closely what the Nevada state government is doing in order to facilitate more affordable housing uh, build up projects uh, and how we can maybe be part of that space. So it's not something that, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of make sure that we're also following what the Nevada Housing Division is doing and how we could maybe be benefactors of, of those actions. Thank you, Madam Chair, for lifting that up. Uh, uh, Commissioner Black. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair McCurdy. I just wanted to uh, express appreciation um, to uh, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Frank Stafford. Uh, even though it's not in my jurisdiction, it's not even in the city that I, I represent, it's an organization that I'm very fond of and appreciative of the work that they do. We uh, did a tour um, and had a great discussion around affordable housing and uh, developing affordable housing at the Blind Center of, of Nevada earlier this week. They do a, a great service to uh, visually impaired individuals throughout our community and are putting a lot of resources and investments into building affordable housing. And I just wanted to appreciate the, the team here for looking into what we can do to perhaps support that effort. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I just follow up on what Olivia said? So are you, do you talk to the state? Do we know that $300 million, is that already committed? Is that, how do we fit into that process? You know, I think that that goes along with the notion of us being at the table. I too saw that you know, saw the news last night and um, looking to find out exactly where and how um, the Housing Authority can be a part of that, that process. You know, historically, these types of funds have not been available and Housing Authority has looked at tax credits and, and um, uh, HUD generated funds to either uh, rehab or expand affordable housing. I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity to um, to tap into those resources. There were a couple of folks at the reception that was hosted for us the other day that I started some preliminary conversations with. Here's an example of following up and making sure that the, um, the housing authority is there. But historically, funds have not necessarily been available, but we're gonna take advantage. And when you look at the tools we have, Section 8 project-based vouchers, land, um, I see a, a tremendous opportunity for us to leverage those dollars. And I'll follow up with the board as to the path that, um, that's been identified for us to follow. But it's about being at the table. And yes, we will be. I have a question. I'm glad you said that because I was just wondering. I'm sorry. I, I'm glad you said that because I saw something on the news regarding uh, affordable housing being given to the people in the community. And all I'm thinking is about when I was in grad school, even though you may not be able to pinpoint just exactly, let's just say the dream that you have, and we can make a dream into a reality. And you said you would be talking. So can you just maybe just give us an idea? Uh, just who you, who you would, even though you're new here, who you may contact or who right. may, may be responsible for contacting that? So that we can just have that, you know, a little bit more closely defined about the steps you'll take in order for us to get that. Well, I think that you, you, you follow the trail of the funding. So I envision sitting down talking to our state. Um, we've started conversations at the county level and the city level. So again, just finding the right people to sit down. And I'm open if some of the commissioners have uh, ideas or suggestions as to who we might reach out to. But it's clear enough, um, the, the, the magic word is housing, affordable housing. That's what we do. So that gives me enough impetus to go knocking on doors, making phone calls to see how we can interact in that process. And you've never, have you ever done this before? I know, you, I know she asked on a broader mm -hmm. base, and I'm just asking for something just yeah. a little bit narrower. Yeah. So I, have I worked with mixed layered financing? Absolutely. I've you know, received dollars from funding sources, both private and publicly, uh, philanthropy, uh, state funding, education funding. It's just a matter of having the wherewithal and the support from team to um, go out and just say, here's what we have to offer. We have a common goal. We're looking to house people. Um, that some of that funding may be earmarked for certain things. 
So if funding is earmarked to support homelessness, we build a case for why we should be a part of that conversation. Some of the funding could be um, earmarked for supports, like you know, recruiting landlords. So there's a plethora of things that could be available. Um, looking at a newscast isn't, you know, hasn't given us a, a strong indication of what's there, but know that the team and I have the wherewithal to dig and find out what monies are available and how we might be able to take advantage of them. Good answer. I'm not going to give you an A yet. I'll just give you a B plus. Come up Sorry. to the A. Uh, thank you so much. And, you know, as has been indicated by our executive director, it is going to be a mix of funding streams, public, mm -hmm. private, um, you know, looking at every tool within the toolbox to make sure that we achieve uh, what we're looking for uh, as it relates to affordable housing, you know, whether we're talking about senior housing, low income housing, uh, mixed income housing. And quite honestly, the housing authority has to be at the at the table, uh, mm -hmm. literally leading the discussion. Uh, because as you know, we know in Clark County, we've earmarked uh, li literally a third of our $440 million for the uh, development of affordable housing. Now, with the state coming in and saying that there will be $300 million uh, of bonding capacity, that just means that, you know, when we get the dollars, we know that we have backing to develop those projects. So looking at the larger picture, uh, we're in a very strong and powerful position Absolutely. to be able to bring more development online. And we have to continue to be vigilant, be a part of the conversations, you know, really inserting ourselves. But I believe at this particular time, uh, with the, um, the environment that we find ourselves in, it's, it's quite timely that, you know, we have the resources in addition to with all the tools that are coming online to help us achieve more affordable housing. So um, I, I'm excited uh, from the county's perspective. I'm excited for what the city of Las Vegas is doing. I saw that yesterday they rolled out, you know, quite a bit of resources to the community as well as the city of North Las Vegas. So when we couple that with the city of Henderson, uh, we're primed to, you know, literally lead the charge as it relates to providing more high quality affordable housing for our residents as well as looking at the tools that we have available to us looking forward into the future we're bringing more vouchers into the stock so commissioner segerblum did you have something to say i was gonna say there, there is that affordable housing coalition are, are you part of that yes we are. okay good yeah and i, I wanted to say if i can uh, mr chair these are while while there's new money coming these are not new conversations you know we we've been working at you know, the coalition um, the, uh, we work, we've worked very carefully, closely right now with the county on the um, distribution of the emergency housing vouchers. We're, we're looking at a number of different things that we might be able to do different. So, so the, the conversations are ongoing. It's just a matter of making sure that, that you know, we're, we're, we're completely connected in when these new dollars are starting to be distributed. And again, I'll reach back out to you all as to some guidance and direction to support the things that the team are already doing. Yes. Um, Commissioner Turner, um, as I understand, there is a process. So I've done some research about the, <clears throat> the whole building, the community, the neighborhood choice uh, programming. And um, <clears throat> let's just be clear, it is a process. First, we have to do the planning, and I'm, I'm realizing that a lot of that will take the support of the residents. And we do have our resident board council and our supportive services. And um, it is uh, one of the major factors is assessing the needs of the community. And um, we will need <laughs> um, the councilmen and, and the rest of our government officials to uh, really look at the needs of that particular community as we build the um, Marble Manor and the rest of the community uh, in that section. So I would just like to make sure that the residents are definitely going to be um, implemented in this whole process. Because like you said, HUD is looking for the revitalization of the community, not just building the housing for those. So I would just like to make sure in that process that we do reach out to the residents and the other people in the community that will help support our planning. Thank you. Yes, and I can just briefly speak to that. That is uh, something that we're definitely engaging in right now, real time. We've had 
uh, conversations with our, our, our neighborhood president, uh, Ms. Rhodes, and um, we're not only going to be speaking with the uh, residents within uh, the impacted area, but also adjacent to, uh, and not just limited to residents, but also uh, business owners as well, uh, because it's truly going to take everyone to get to the type of product that we're looking to bring into the community uh, with the type of amenities that we're looking to have within that should greatly benefit the, the, the opportunities within the residents that will be there. And if I can just reiterate your, your point, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, uh, Ms. Rhodes has a predominant role in our, in our rollout to her next, uh, next Thursday. She'll be an integral part um, as a part of the team and the voice of the residents. So thank you for sharing that, but we, we'll make sure that we continue to move along that path. Not to backtrack, but um, um, Commissioner Scott Black brought the attention to the Blind Center, which I'm very passionate about. Um, I have um, known people that are um, uh, disabled by that, uh, that affliction. However, um, I'm glad to note that we'll be um, actually on the process of looking at other um, sites to help the disabled, the blind, because I did see in our plan, um, it was our five-year plan, we don't have anything specifically designated for people that do have disabilities in our housing. Yes, they can get into public housing. Yes, they'll have their vouchers, but I'll be very interested in that conversation to help build um, out or help plan um, anything that has to do with um, those individuals that might have disabilities and the housing that can serve them. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If, excuse me. I'm sorry. And I, I just want to say uh, one of the thing about being, this is Commissioner Craig, one of the thing about being uh, socioeconomically limited and having a disability, which she so gratefully addressed, is feeling alienated. And one change I really, really, really would love to see, you talked about something that impressed me very much, and I believe you're going to do it, Mr. Mr. Jordan, is a customer service. And I want to reiterate that we, no matter how poor we are, we are your customers. And if we are your customers, sometimes because if even if you have a high school education, you know sometimes when you're dealing with people that are social or economically limited, they feel disenfranchised. And there's so many things that they're contending against that sometimes they just don't understand what you're saying. And even when all this is done, I'm just asking or pleading, if I must get on my knees, is that you understand that just coming to us once does not mean we understand. Sometimes twice does not mean we understand. Sometimes you have to come to us five or six times or different ways, somehow the other to understand that we don't always get it, but we can get it. You know, some of you all drive nice cars and that's nice, but some of you all think, well, I told them, I'm sorry, my dear, we're dealing with health issues, we're dealing with property. And all I'm asking is just for you all to be empathetic when you do this, considering the residents, considering, because some of you all don't know what it's like to be blind. Some of you all don't know what it's like to be disadvantaged, but sometimes we're people too. And we matter. All I want you all to do is really encourage. Somebody made a statement that you all made these plans and you really all did not get the request of the residents on the papers. I forget exactly what it was. I would like to see when we do this what residents you all have contacted, how you contacted us, what the methodologies were, and what the responses were, and have it written on paper. I'm not trying to chastise anybody, but it's just difficult to deal with this when we're dealing with so many variables and we're trying to live. Just live. I think that's a valid point. And, um, you know, for the record, uh, many of us that are on the board today were not a part of the initial planning, uh, nor were we a part of the initial rollout. Uh, but I can speak for myself and uh, maybe a few others on the board that we will make sure that we, we, we utilize our role and our authority as commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority Board uh, to ensure that there is accountability and, more importantly, transparency. But I feel you. I feel you. So. Uh, we'll go from there. Uh, is there any other comments at this time? Are there any other comments at this time? Mr. Wright. Commissioner Diaz, Chairwoman. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of echo the sentiments of Commissioner Craig and um, also tell our staff to really look at our diversity, equity, and inclusion practices and um, also make sure that we're addressing language, potential language barriers, right? So. Um, we've heard it come before our body before where 
people feel that um, we are disenfranchising those that don't speak English. And so what are we doing to our extent possible to communicate with tenants whose uh, language is another language, their predominant language is one that is not English. So how are we working around that? Um, how are we making sure that we don't look down upon our residents because they don't speak the language well, but how, what, what, uh, what tools are we using again to use Commissioner McCurdy's uh, terms? What tools are we using to make sure that they're understanding our communication and that they're able to understand what we need of them when there's a change in a process, uh, there's a change, a, a way they have to go about a request, et cetera. So I would like to be kind of apprised on uh, what our current practices are and how we're making sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. So what I would request is, uh, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, is that after the meeting next Thursday, at our next uh, commissioner's meeting, uh, we just have a, a, a debrief, if you will, on those conversations so that we can uh, make sure that we're rolling it out uh, to the community in a way that everyone knows that we actually have a plan that's going to be inclusive and also uh, forward thinking in terms of communication out. Absolutely. You know, I, I just wanted to comment that um, I, I think all that we're talking about starts with the foundation of making sure that everyone feels as though they're being treated with dignity and respect. And, and I, I know for a fact that from a foundational standpoint, that's always our intent. Um, we have, uh, we're immersing ourselves in training to make sure that people understand. Sometimes our our biases are implicit and sometimes we just don't know, but that isn't an excuse, particularly if someone isn't feeling as though they're being inclusive. So again, staff is going through training and we're using real time experiences to make sure that we're addressing those issues. Um, as complaints come in to you that hopefully they end up with me and so as we start to address them and we can also work with staff on making sure that, that people are not just listened to, but people are heard. And it's, it's critically important, um, be it this process of CNI or not, we need an environment, we must have an environment where people feel as though they're treated with dignity and respect. And we'll continue to strive to, um, to hit those points, but being in an, in a, um, at an agency that, that I strongly believe fosters um, constant improvement and constant education or consistent education leads to consistent improvement. And that's a part of the foundation that we're going to stand on as we value those who, who are our tenants and then those who wish to be our tenants or our partners. Sorry, but since we're getting everything off our chest, I guess we can go ahead and keep talking. <laughs> so, uh, Chair Diaz made a point about um, being able to speak to everyone in bilingual. Do we have any in, in, in incentive, but some kind of a 5% bonus or something for bilingual employees? Yes, we do. We, we have that. And when we have public meetings, based on the percentage of people who are our tenants or partners who attend our meetings, um, we have uh, someone who speaks that additional language. So when we have resident meetings, for example, um, we will have someone who will interpret in Spanish. If there's another language um, that's present, we'll have someone who can interpret in that, that language as well. And we recognize both um, staff and um, if need needed, we'll bring in a vendor to support us in that. I have another question, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to talk about, well, that's my heart too. We have Chinese and Japanese in our building and I think I spoke to someone when I went to my disability uh, uh -huh. conference, and I was told that there was a representative number that they utilized in order for various languages. And I really, as a commissioner, would like to see where there's been a study done on the residents and all the building, the percentages of people that speak Japanese or Chinese or French or whatever, 2%. and that. Uh, I really think that's important because there's just a sense of alienation. I really would like to see that so that we can know the last meeting we had, we had a Spanish speaker that was there, but there were people who also speak Japanese and, and Philippine and they didn't understand what was going on. So I, that's crucial. 
Very well. We can do that. Is there anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll now uh, move to our second uh, portion of public comment, which is citizens' participation. Uh, this is a time where you can bring up items, um, whether they're uh, on the agenda or things that you're experiencing. Please come forward. You will have uh, three minutes, and please state your name and uh, where you reside. Mr. Johnson. John Johnson for the John Johnson for the record. So, um, and our what property are you in? Um, I'm a section eight okay. uh, voucher holder. Can you set your address? Oh, my address. Um, oh, I just moved, but now why my address got to get put out there? I don't, I don't understand that. And anyway, it's uh 7853 Windham Ridge Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada 89131. Um, so the issue that I'm talking about, I talked with uh, John Gleason and actually me and uh, Commissioner Black had a long conversation about this, about the uh, committees. Those committees reports that you guys just were supposed to give or didn't give, those committees when they meet, they're supposed to be open public, open meeting law. So they're supposed to meet just like you guys meet. And when I first asked about this a few months ago, when you guys first appointed everybody, I believe it was Commissioner Diaz that said no, that they don't have to follow open meeting law. It was actually a meeting of the school, school board that even brought it up because they're opening up a committee, but they didn't want to follow open meeting law, so they gave it to the superintendent, and now he's opening up that committee. So after calling the open meeting law uh, department in the uh, attorney general's office, he gave me the law. So it specifically says here under the um, definitions, a subcommittee or working group consisting of at least two people who are appointed by a public body described in paragraph A, B, or C if majority of the memberships of the subcommittee or working group are members of or staff of the public body that appointed the subcommittee. So that's you guys. Members of the subcommittee are part of the official public body. So by definition, you guys are considered, your subcommittees are considered public bodies. You guys have to follow the open meeting law just like this meeting. Second, the subcommittee or working group is authorized by the public body to make recommendations to the public body for the public body to take action. To give you an example, you guys who are city council members and commissioners, you guys are familiar. Your boards have um, uh, veterans committees. You guys have you know committees where people in the community can serve. You can appoint people to it. You can appoint people to it. But they also have to, to follow open meeting law. The reason why is when they meet, they can make a decision that can be recommended to the upper body for passage. As a taxpayer, it doesn't even matter if I did have Section 8 or not, or was a member or not. I pay my taxes, and my taxes are used for this program. So as a taxpayer, I have a right to be involved in every step of my government process. I have that right. And by you guys not doing the open meeting law, you guys are taking my right as a taxpayer away from me. Thank you. Well, glad we have your name and um, address on, on the record. We'll have um, someone follow up with you. Is there anyone else who would like to write comment? And again, uh, you, there will not be back and forth provided during this time. Someone will follow up with you after this is just uh, an opportunity for us to hear concerns and we will follow up. There's uh, uh, members taking notes as well. Good morning, all. My name is Vanessa Hamlin. I'm a resident at Jamestown Towers. I'd like to start by saying welcome, Mr. Jordan, thank you. and thank you for popping up at Jamestown Towers a couple of weeks ago. He came in as undercover boss, knowing that we had been having major heating issues over there and just popped in on a Friday without a suit on, unannounced. Nobody knew who he was, but uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, I had several items that I wanted to address. Uh, I won't go into detail. I'm asking for a meeting with you or other staff members 
to address some of these items because I don't think uh, that it's fitting that it be addressed here at a, a Board of Commission meeting. So I would like to have a meeting and possibly with other residents. Mm -hmm. Not all of it affects Jamestown Towers, but a housing authority in general. Uh, some related to customer service has been mentioned here several times today. So of course that is one of the items I'm concerned about. Some of your forms, some of your policies, and certain other things. Um, and then I also wanted to thank you and Mr. Stafford. A suggestion was put out there that for the RAD meetings, rather than giving us notice a week before, or a couple of days before, give us a schedule for the next six months. Knowing you're coming for six months, give us a day, any day of the week. Similar to what y'all doing here, third Thursday of every month, pick a day time, which you did, we thank you. But in addition to that, thank you for doing that. I would also like to suggest that maybe before the RAD meetings, there be a reminder to the residents. And I'm not asking that you go door to door with notices, but maybe put something in the public areas, uh, just as a reminder that the meeting's Tuesday or whatever. And, uh, Looking forward to talking to you and addressing some other issues. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to give you a little happy, happy. Uh, we've been told we're going to have landscaping. Oh, Janice Loretz, uh, Espinosa Terrace, Henderson. And I'm in 4E. And uh, we've been told we're going to have landscaping, and I've already had people coming up to me going, yes, they're all happy because they're tired of it looking so bad. Uh, also, they removed two big, huge containers that were on the property since I've been living there. And they've been in the back parking lot that's next to our wall, which is next to a walking path in the railroad. So... I looked out the other night because sometimes I get up at three, four o'clock in the morning or whatever. I could see all the way to the corner of Pacific and the railroad tracks. And also, thank you so much for security. We have, I've met the corporal, the sergeant, and the lieutenant. But we've not had a flyer come out with their phone number. That's something a lot of people would like is the phone number for our security people. But it is already people are noticing and they're appreciative. And just another say thank you for at least I got something here. And one of my res the residents, we were sitting out at our gazebo just BSing and talking football and everything. And he says, was that you that got them to, so we're going to get landscaping? I said, I took it to them and it was up to them. I had, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So we showed him the pudding and it didn't look too good. So now then they're going to do something about it. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine. I'd like to welcome you also, and I would also like to sit down with you. I have called your office and they refused to make a meeting with me or a meeting with you. They refused it. Um, okay, so there was a leak in my kitchen uh, it had brown, or the black fuzzy mold coming out of it. They just put drywall over it. It rained. It's leaking there again. I pointed it out to maintenance. They said, oh, that wasn't a leak. It is a leak. Um, when they came out, you sent the superintendent, maintenance, supervisor, and the manager out. They told me everything from the moisture in my bathroom was from the pee trap. Then he turned around and he said he hadn't even read any of the mold reports. So I gave him the mold reports. Then he tried to say that the mold was coming from outside. It was the outside spores that was in my house. Um, it was asinine. Then I took the meter and I stuck it to my ground and it came up 33% moisture. I can show you the picture where the leak is. Um, they pulled the floor. At first they said that they, was, they would pull the, the flooring and address it at that time. They pulled the flooring. I can show you where it's wet. And then they just put the RDX, which is the 12 by 12 squares, that they put in the schools and other buildings. They put that down before they put the ninoleum down. 
there's a leak in my bathroom. That's been my main concern the whole time is the moisture in my bathroom. It hasn't been the mold. You guys are the ones that did the air test that show the mold levels. Um, security, cars are being break, broken into. We call security, they say call Metro. What is their job? They ain't even on property all the time. You know what I mean? And you guys up their contract and now that you up their contract, they're really not there all the time. Um, Every time I brought up the, like it'll be every couple weeks, I'll bring up the leak in the bathroom. They retaliate against me every time with the lease violation, trying to say that I have a lease violation. Um, SFS says 32 hours is full time employment. Um, I asked for, and it said something about in the last m minutes or whatever in the last agenda that I asked for the con plan. No, I asked for the public comment. For the past five years, I wanted to see all the public comment is what I wanted. And it wasn't the whole spiel. Um, Google, my Google account in June of 17, in June of 19, when I was, a, when I was elected to the Marble Manor Resident Council, there was an enterprise account that was the administrator on my account. It's no longer enterprise, it's now Google Workspace. That needs to be taken care of. Um, Employees taking people's belongings. People pass away, the maintenance will come, they even bring their own trailers and load up the, the electric wheelchairs to take them home. That's not right. Um, oh, I had to sign a special. You could take another five seconds. Right okay, I had to sign a special e EIV, which is electronic information verification. And in this electronic information verification, it, it was a special piece of paper that I had never signed for housing. I have lived in housing since 2011. They wanted me to, to sign off on it and leave it blank. Like it, I said, no, I'm not signing it unless it's Sonara or, or it says Sonara or HUD. On that same piece of paper, it said I made $6,500 more than I did at Beaver Estates. So um, what we'll do is if you stay after, we'll, we'll make sure to get your comments and we'll go from there. Is there anyone else that would wish to testify uh, for citizen participation? All right, seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.